Welcome to everyone for the second webinar organized by the GISCA group. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to moderate the today section. And uh, considering that we have uh, more than 400 registration for 40 different nations, I say ciao a tutti because I can't say good morning, good afternoon or the good evening. Anyway, uh, we will have uh, uh, three lectures today and uh, the most important thing is that uh, you have the possibility to be interactive with us. Uh, remember that uh, you can write uh, on the chat uh, in the form uh, all the questions that uh, you have for, every, uh, for having an interaction at the end of every lecture. Uh, thanks to Striker, that is the sponsorship uh, of uh, uh, today, and uh, trying to go directly to the first uh, lecture. It's a pleasure to introduce to you a good friend of mine, that is uh, E.B. Yunis. E.B. Yunis uh, is a consultant plastic surgeon, uh, plastic and reconstructive surgeon at the Royal Free Hospital University College of London. In uh, his uh, uh, CV, we can uh, subtitle that uh, he is uh, a multitasking plastic surgeon specialized in breast, abdomen, body contouring, and in wood healing, skin and wood healing. He uh, was awarded by the Royal College of Surgeons in uh, England in plastic surgery. And uh, his topic today will be about the interaction between surgery and scar. So, Ibi, you can go. It's a pleasure for me to uh, pay attention to your lecture. Uh, thank you, Franco. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And it's nice to be with friends again that I haven't seen in face to face like everyone else for over a year now. And uh, Franco, you called me a multitasking plastic surgeon, um, but desperately trying to follow into your footsteps. And one day I may get close to your dizzy heights. So um, the 1980s in the UK is very fashionable, the music, the cars. But when it comes to uh, improving scars, improving healing, uh, uh, I think we need to move away from the 1980s and innovate. And that's what my talk is all about. It's my almost accidental discovery of innovations where I'm trying to get something healed up. But at the same time, I'm thinking, can I improve the scar? So um, these are the therapies that I use. You're going to come across them again and again. A lot to go through. So Dr. Yeah. Dr. E.B., you, you, Dr. Eunice, you need to put your screen in, like in, with PowerPoint, like in full in screen sharing, oh. like in the full screen. Okay. okay, fine. Bear with me. Let me just check. Sorry about that. Uh, so it wasn't uh, stop screen share. So I'm sharing now. Yeah. Is that okay? No, you will need to like sh sh share your full screen with like your presentation. Okay, bear with me. Sorry for this um, live yeah, so, problem. So maybe maybe if you can if you can I stop like sharing? yeah stop sharing and do it again. Okay, sorry guys. Share screen. Here we go. How's that? You need to choose your presentation too. Here we go. I think we're good. How's that? Mm, you need to go like in, f yes, exactly. Perfect. So sorry for oh, that, that was... Dr. Ribi, the, the floor is okay, yours. Awesome. No, you need to come back. To, to come back to be... Could everyone hear me, but they couldn't see the screen. Is that right? Now we set up for success. You can go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you again, uh, Franco. So I think my talk is uh, about innovation in healing uh, of wounds. And I think there's an overlap with healing of a wound and the quality of the scarring. And my talk is all gonna be about moving away from the 1980s, even though it's very fashionable in the UK, the music, the cars, um, uh, but we need to move away from the 1980s and innovate. And my innovations have been quite accidental. Um, I've discovered negative pressure wound therapy with, it, with uh, installation and dwell time. Incisional negative pressure, really important in wound healing and improving the scar. Dermal matrices, 
vital in improving the quality of the scar, I think, and uh, as well as fat transfer and topical wound oxygen. You'll come across all of this. And, and for me, um, it's about raising the bar. I think now, I think it's okay to say, uh, getting the wound healed is not good enough. You need to get it healed with the best possible scar, as flat as possible, no contour defect, not stretched. Um, we've got the innovations and the kit out there to do this. Um, I basically operate, as uh, Franco said, everywhere except hands and uh, burns. And you're going to come across negative pressure with installation. These are the three different types of dressings. Uh, the, the whole principle is about instilling fluid with the soak time and then negative pressure. It's soaking. Uh, it's like the soaking concept rather than having a shower. Um, and it gives you more granulation tissue than standard back. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with standard back. And there's many consensus guidelines out there. We're going to touch upon Provena, incisional negative pressure wound therapy. This is what I use for my incisional negative wound therapy. Uh, it reduces lateral tension, reduces edema, uh, also a contamination barrier. And more importantly, it gives you a much better scar when you take that uh, Provena dressing off after a week or now as I'm doing two weeks and there's many many publications on this and it even appears in the WHO guidelines for high-risk surgery. Um, you'll also see how I use um, topical wound oxygen. Everyone knows oxygen is very important for wound healing but oxygen also I find gives you as far as I'm concerned a much better scar um, and, and there's some there's some evidence out there not a huge amount but there's enough evidence there for you guys to get interested. And I'm a big fan of dermal substitutes. I know Luke Teo is also a big fan of dermal substitutes. My favorite is uh, Matriderm. It's got collagen, elastin, and the collagen is very much like human uh, collagen and revascularizes much quicker because of the elastin. And I love fat. Fat is the future. There's many devices out there, including the traditional Coleman technique. My favorite is Revolve. Uh, Plenty of evidence how Revolve uh, is much better. It gives you much better quality aspirate, much better quality of flat, fat rather, um, and um, you tend to lose less fat as well. So um, that's just sort of the science behind it. Now for some cases. So um, this is a patient who's got multiple scars in his abdomen. Umbilicus is all twisted. I want to rationalize the scars. I need to fix the hernia with the general surgeon, uh, use a bio mesh, and then I'm really pushing the limits here. A lot of dead tissue there potentially. Uh, there's the hernia. But what am I going to do here? I'm going to make him a new umbilicus, use a proven dressing, and this is him post-op. And I'm sure you'd agree, there's a big improvement. We've taken away a lot of the necessary scarring. We've given you a new umbilicus. It's tight. We've pushed the limits, but we've got away with it because of negative pressure. This is a big melon lateral hernia. There's got a, there's got a smaller umbilical hernia too as well big piece of mesh, very difficult hernias to repair these, fascial flaps, and again, Provena, high-risk surgery, you wanna use uh, individual negative pressure, you'll get a better quality scar. Uh, this young lady lost all of rectus muscle on the right side, it's all skin graft that you can see, and a uh, big piece of mesh. Uh, I wasn't too sure what I was gonna do here, but I managed to get fascial closure, and again, uh, very high risk, you're pushing the limits again, you're gonna use individual negative pressure. However, you do have complications, and I get my complications. This is a patient who had a hernia repair, but this, I used incisional negative pressure, my own VAC therapy, but the wound hissed. I then vac it again. And so traditional VAC therapy is fine. It healed, but it healed with some tethering, scarring, and this talk is all about scarring. And you can see it's, it's okay. It's not as good as my other results, but it's okay. So this lady, again, abdominal wall reconstruction, a uh, big piece of mesh, used Provena, but delayed healing. And she didn't want VAC. I wanted to do VAC. It needs VAC. It needs negative pressure. But instead, I wanted, I used topical oxygen because she didn't want the big uh, the portable uh, VAC pump. And this is, uh, we continue with the oxygen. And the oxygen, you know, after two weeks gets quite wet. Um, you know, it's doing the debridement process for you. And this is all with oxygen. And what I found here was quite interesting is that with oxygen and avoiding negative pressure, there's much less tethering. So here's tethering, negative pressure, fibrosis, scarring. Here, less fibrosis, less scarring, no negative pressure, oxygen. It got me interested. Um, you know, twin pregnancy, abdominoplasty, um, no hernia, uh, but uh, very weak rectus muscles, rectus sheath, um, very, very low scar, really pushing the limits here. And again, you know, you want to use an negative pressure 
And this is, even though I've, there's a lot of tension on that scar, um, it's a young, fit, healthy patient, but that scar is a lovely scar. And again, the scar should be, the, 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 there's no contour defect. The scar is smooth. There's no indentation. And I think um, uh, it, it's all very well saying you've got a thin scar, but you've got to have a thin scar without any indentation whatsoever. So I apply the same principle, negative pressure for circumferential body lifts. This is one of the circumferential body lifts I do. And this is a post-op. I use incisional negative pressure with no issues whatsoever. A slightly lumpy scar, but um, you know there's a lot of tension laterally. So um, this is a multiple fistula, um, and it's we couldn't get his abdomen closed, so we used a bridging mesh. It's a biological mesh there. You can see it, strapped it, vacked it, and this is what it looks like. At this point, you think it's all going to fall apart. Um, what do you do here? You know what? You keep vacking. You use flamazine underneath the vac. You keep vacking. Then you do a skin graft. You keep vacking. You keep vacking, and eventually, you get there. You get to this point here. And I thought that was all going to break down. So sometimes you've got to think outside the box and use whatever you, whatever is, whatever you can get your hands on. And I think negative pressure is a very important part of my life. And I think it will be um, uh, for those li listening as well. If you see an abdomen like this, never close an abdomen like this because it's going to fall apart. Um, loads of um, bowel exposed, uh, slough. Uh, this is a case I saw when I was a trainee. We, we applied some larvae. We did a skin graft. It's okay, not a great result, not my case. When I saw as my trainee, I got this case, similar situation, bowel exposed, a little bit of granulation tissue. What do you do here? We can't reconstruct her abdomen. She's probably got 18 months to live. So we use the white foam, which is non-adherent. We vac it, we get granulation tissue. We apply some dermal matrix. We let that integrate. Uh, and then we do a skin graft. And, uh, and, and now she's got a bit more padding than she would have done normally. That's her. Yeah. Keep walking, keep walking. And I'm sure you agree that's a much better result than the one I dealt with when I was a trainee. Um, this is uh, an open abdomen with uh, fistula coming out. Again, we use negative pressure to get this closed, uh, as well as a negative pressure with installation. So this is um, quite uh, an amazing case. Um, she was, the patient was um, uh, essentially 220, over 200 kilograms at the end of pregnancy, had a complication, had an emergency cesarean section, her BMI was 83. She had developed necrotizing fasciitis six days after. Here's a necrotizing fasciitis, a lot of dead tissue. Someone vacked it, it's not gonna do any good. What you do here, you've got to think outside the box. Um, you don't want to leave a wound completely open. If I leave this wound completely open, I'll never get it closed. So I uh, debride the dead tissue. I know there's going to be ongoing necrosis. Here it is. And so I use my in and out technique with Veriflow. Um, you get the idea. Uh, I'm moving quickly so you get an idea. And I keep debriding. I keep doing my in and out technique. I keep the skin stretched. Uh, and then uh, there's a long scar, very high risk. What do I do to this scar? There's going to be a lot of edema, a lot of tension. Uh, I'm going to use, I'm sure you'd have guessed it by now, Provena, I used four uh, because it's managing the environment of the wound. I used it for two weeks. And even, even it's three weeks later, she was still having Provena. There's still some leakage from the wound, but we eventually got there. She was home within three months after a very, very serious issue. And she could have died in hospital. It was that serious. Um, um, I'm very jealous of Ferrando's paper, who was a prize winning, winning paper on um, negative pressure and breast reconstruction. I use negative pressure as well. And uh, we use, um, these are implant-based reconstructions. We started to use a smaller Provena. Then I started to make my Provena bra. Um, for those of you who are doing breast reconstruction, I can't recommend it enough. Um, so these are implant-based or ba implant-based breast reconstructions. And this is what I used to do with my Provena. I used to sort of make all sorts of designs, uh, nipple sparing mastectomies, high risk with a nipple lift, pushing the limits here. So you've got to have everything going for you. Now we've got the Provena Bella Restore. This is what I use, shaped like a breast. It's amazing. It's incredible. And that's her post-op. So this is a nipple sparing mastectomy with a nipple lift, with an implant and ADM reconstruction. But we get complications. So um, this was one I did with the skin reduction, used Provena. But look at that areola on the left. Looks a bit dodgy. Yes, it's not very good. What do I do? Gentle debridement and oxygen. Just sit it out with oxygen. And that's all I did. And it healed with oxygen. And actually with good quality healing, <laughs> not terrible scar tissue. And that's her post-op. So I think I, I keep these things in my mind, all these adjuncts. 
this is a pie that my wife Wayne made one night, but she made she put two breasts on. She made sure one breast was much smaller than the other. Uh, I use fat as well. Uh, breast asymmetry fat is amazing. Uh, uh, it works really well. Um, this is another case where I did the breast lift and then fat transfer, no implants. So I think fat has an important place in my practice. This kind of situation, which is more reconstructive, uh, you know, fat transfer works really, really well. Remember, it's about obliterating the contour defect. This patient has got indented scars stuck to the chest wall. She needs a reconstruction. What are you gonna do before reconstruction? Fat transfer, release the scar and improve the quality of the skin. And that's what all the patients say. They say the skin feels better. Then we do an LD flat reconstruction with implant and she's in a much better place. After implant-based reconstruction, a bit of irregularity, indentation, more fat transfer, works really well. Subtle changes, subtle effects. Um, and um, I'm sure you've, sorry, oh, you've seen this before. This patient, tummy tuck, breast lift, uh, fat transfer. Um, so I'm pushing the limit and I'm using my incisional negative pressure all linked together. Uh, one week, wound check, uh, six weeks. This is six weeks post-op. And I'm sure you'd agree, those scars have settled beautifully with the help of incisional negative pressure. Uh, a stump that's infected, full of pus, uh, horrible inside. We use Veriflow, uh, we clean it up, we continue the Veriflow, uh, we use all the Veriflow types of dressings, um, and uh, we do a debridement every time. There's no substitute for debridement. And then when it's clean enough, we'll uh, decide to get it closed. But of course, it's a high risk wound. So we use uh, a, a Provena Bella Restore, which is designed for breast, but I think it's perfect for stumps as well. And that's a wound. At one week, it looks like a three week old wound. Um, and this is a six week wound check. This is a six week wound check. Um, and then um, this is neck rash, my case, skin grafted, no dermal matrix, uh, just back for a week. Uh, this is neck rash again, a lot of tenders exposed. I thought I could do better. So I used Veriflow. Uh, then I used dermal matrix, Matriderm. Um, and my objective was to have no indentation. I wanted to get the tendons covered, more matriderm, more skin graft. Uh, that's the donor site. And delayed healing, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to use oxygen. You've seen it before. Um, and this is, oxygen just did this. That wound got smaller and smaller with oxygen. So you go from here to there. And compare the two. There's matriderm or a dermal matrix with Veriflow and VAC versus no, mat no dermal matrix uh, and no Veriflow. Uh, there's no contour defect. In yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. I've ordered up. And so for me, it's 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 raising the standard. And this is my last case. I'm finishing in about three minutes, Franco. Um, British Princess James Ellington and Nigel Levine are conscious and stable after a motorbike accident during warm weather training in Tenerife. So this is a British Olympic sprinter. Um, he's won uh, uh, medals. Um, he in, in the relay for the British team. Uh, they won gold in the European comp competition, as you can see here. And, and he was um, he came second in the British Olympic trial, so he was selected for the Olympic Games. So he was on an Olympic training camp, and he had a crash on a bike in Tenerife. So uh, he had a nasty open fracture of the tibia, uh, and there's the, they yanked the wound together. They put him in an X fix. Uh, and that's what it looked like when it opened up. And there's the fracture. So this is an Olympic sprinter. His life is all about sprinting. He's an athlete. And he said, give me hope. I want to get back on track. I want to compete. We all looked at each other and we said, no chance. But, you know, if it's his life, you have to do your best. You have to give him a chance. So this is a fracture. It's a mess. So my, normally people would have a titanium nail in. The orthoped orthopedic surgeon I work with, he said, you're an athlete, let's put something lighter and stronger. So he put a carbon fiber intermediary nail in. You can't see it in the x-ray. You can see the screws, but not the carbon fiber nail. And then, so I have to up my game as well. The plastic surgery textbook says, gastrocnemius flap. This is the flap that I would normally use. But I'm also aware of this paper um, by Stannard, where, where he showed incisional negative pressure on um, tra traumatic lower limb injuries. So I opened him up, cleaned out the hematoma. There's a fracture. If I do the gastroc flap, I'm using fast twitch fibers. He's never going to sprint, uh, you know, 100 meters around 10 seconds. So I closed him up. I, I, I took a big gamble, incisional vac, took it off after a week, another week of vac, took it off, another week of vac, took it off. That's three weeks now, and another week of vac, 
And that's after four weeks of incisional negative pressure, three months and nine months later. And uh, this was a reaction when the, after four weeks of negative pressure. Wow. James, what do you think? So, I'll take a... Yeah, good What do you think? Sick. <laughs> what do you say? Sick. So he said it's sick, which means it's very, very good. James Ellington and Nigel Levine are just unstable after a motorbike accident in Tenerife. Well, I thought, is this a dream? I went to pinch myself and wake up. I was thinking, please wake up. And then obviously I realised it wasn't. Um, and then I looked down at my legs, checked my legs, and obviously my right leg, my, well, my left. So the Provena made it on BBC News. This is his x-ray before, uh, a few months after. 18 months after the fractures remodeled. I forgot to mention, he's got a pelvic fracture too that was fixed. So he had a double injury. And this is the training he used to do before the surgery, before. Um, and this is uh, the training he used again to do before the injury. And this is what he did uh, 18 months after the injury. You can see he's got a bit of pain. And we start with the Japanese athletes in four three. A new Scott of interview, but he's coming back out and hits the front. So he's coming back to play. He's in down in nine point nine six on the second oh, he's the best of the season. So he ran, he competed two years after the injury, full stadium, he came last. But it doesn't matter. He ran 100 meters in under 11 seconds, and the media were after him. Never died. I think that was it. The media were after him and no one else because it wasn't about who came first. It was about this amazing comeback uh, by this amazing athlete who's an inspiration and a complete motivation from a horrific injury where I we all took a bit of a gamble. Uh, uh, by not using his gastrocnemius flap and using four weeks of residual negative pressure. Uh, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, E.B., for your outstanding lecture, especially in the last uh, part. I think that uh, you put the finger in one of uh, the most important problems that, for example, in Italy we still have, that is the orthoplastic approach that unfortunately it's very difficult to be obtained. I think that uh, the winner of that uh, uh, result was the surgeon, the plastic surgeon that had the possibility to be active in the first five days after the fracture. And this is what we are doing in Italy, trying to uh, create orthoplastic units in which uh, the approach of the orthopedic is common with the approach of the plastic surgeon because they, at the the beginning, they put an external fixation that permitted to us to be radical in necrectomy and trying to do together the internal fixation for the bone fracture and the use of muscle um, flap to cover the exposed fracture. So with this uh, approach, you can obtain this kind of, uh, of results. We don't see a question on the chat, so I am inviting all of you to write directly on the chat, on the YouTube chat. And uh, uh, for example, we have the first one now that it's uh, coming from Netherlands, Hester Middelkoop, that is asking uh, what was the reason to use flamazine under back? Okay, um, um, thank you, Franco. Um, great question, Esther. Esther, um, uh, Esther is a is a great friend and uh, who I haven't seen for again over a year, uh, sadly. Uh, and Esther's a scientist, and so it's always very difficult to get for a simple surgeon like me to give a really good answer to a very very clever scientist. Uh, but what I will say is that it was it was interesting at the time. It was full of pseudomonas, the stratus, the biological mesh. And so we thought, well, flamazine gets rid of pseudomonas. And we smeared it underneath over the mesh and put the vac over the top. We used a bit of hydrocolloid around the side to get a seal. Um, and it was nothing more clever than that, Esther. Um, it was just to get rid of the pseudomonas. And it sort of worked. 
until we got to a point where we could do a skin graft, of course. Other question, what about the lymphatics, especially in your fat reduction surgery? This is another good question because now we have a particular attention to the lymphatic flow that it's fundamental to prevent seromas and so on. What is your opinion? This so, comes from Mariel Picand Tagliabue. Uh, Muriel, fantastic question. We could talk about lymphatics for a whole day. Uh, but when it comes to fat reduction surgery, uh, I think you're probably referring to the body lift. Um, I like, I, I think I am the same like many people. I try to keep a layer of fascia uh, on the, on the uh, sorry, a, la a layer of uh, fat on the fascia layer. Um, uh, what I've done also previously, the cases I've been shown, I've previously done liposuction and left all the subcutaneous tissue behind where the lymphatics are and just really literally taken away the skin and not much else. So I've done both techniques. Um, but I have to say one thing, where I've done the liposuction before and then I've taken away the excess skin, but skin only and not taking the subcutaneous underneath, I don't need to use drains because the lymphatics are preserved and all the lymphatics take the fluid away. Where I've not done that technique, I do use drains and I leave them in. And I think, Muriel, um, your question is particularly also a problem with breast implant-based reconstruction. I know you spoke about fat reduction surgery, but when we were doing breast implant reconstruction ADM, drains is an issue. I'm having to keep my drains in for 10 days, and I really, um, I, I would love to find a solution of um, um, not having to use drains. Patients hate it, we hate it, risk of infection and everything else. Um, I think, um, the, 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 the new Provena Bella dressing, which covers the breast completely, uh, it may, it's not going to take away the seroma issue, but I think it will improve it. So maybe you can take your drains out two or three days early because there'll be less dead space. And it's, so it's about, so it's a, it's a good question and we could talk about it forever, but I hope that answers your question. Any other question? I have one for you. As uh, you can see, I'm wearing the suite for going the, in the operating room because we are waiting for another uh, necrotizing fasciitis. That it's an emergency that we see uh, every day. So what is your approach uh, in the, this uh, type of uh, emergency? Uh, sorry, Franco, what kind of emergency, if you don't mind not, uh, asking? <laughs> Necrotizing fasciitis. Okay, so my protocol for necrotizing fasciitis is really clear now uh, because uh, from what I've learned, uh, you debride, of course, Veraflow, not VAC, Veraflow, negative pressure with installation. Uh, I'm sorry I'm using sort of uh, trade names, but um, they're so sort of synonymous. Um, and then Veraflow for maybe a week, uh, change it once, and then I would... A week later, when the patient's stable, everything's better, then I would go to a dermal matrix. Uh, like I said before, I'm a big fan of Matroderm at the moment, um, and I will be, uh, and I've used others as well. And then on the Matroderm, you apply VAC, not Veraflow. If you use Veraflow, it will disintegrate. And then take your time. Leave that 2 millimeter Matroderm in place. Let it integrate. Let the granulation tissues come through. You're trying to obliterate uh, the, de the contour defect and then do your skin graft week three week four doesn't matter T be, take it slow uh before you do the skin graft get something and just wipe away a lot of that extra granulation tissue it's all harboring bacteria don't be scared um and then do the skin graft and as you saw with that uh with the with the case with the orthopedic surgeon as a patient uh, there was literally no indentation no contour defect whatsoever and that's exactly what i did with him he had some delayed healing of the exposed tendons and I used a bit of oxygen there and it sort of seemed to work well because in, with my with my experience, the oxygen is just, uh, 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 you know, with oxygen, I see less fibrosis, less scarring, more better quality tissue. Um, um, and other, other people who use topical wood oxygen are seeing the same thing. 
Another question from the chat. Uh, how do you see the relationship between fibrosis and uh, lymph lymphangiogenesis? Okay, Franco, um, I'm, I'm not too sure what I understand by lymphangiogenesis. What uh, maybe Marianne Altomare is uh, asking if uh, you think that uh, when you develop fibrosis uh, in a scar, in uh, yeah. uh, maybe you you can have uh, a last lasting a problem uh, of uh, lymphangiogenesis. So the the patient will have uh, uh, maybe a big arm or problem uh, of uh, uh, lymphangiogenesis. That it's uh, another huge problem uh, in uh, reconstructive surgery. What do you think? how to prevent the development of lymphangiogenesis. Right. No, I understand. Um, so lymphedema, I understand. Sorry, just a slight difference in terminology, Marianne. Uh, good and interesting question. So um, just digressing slightly, we're in our unit. I've just been given the approval to do lymphovenous uh, anastomosis. So when someone's having a mastectomy now and auxiliary clearance, uh, we've started doing lymphovenous anastomosis to reduce the risk of uh, lymphedema uh, but your so that's one of the things we've started doing uh, in terms of fibrosis and avoiding lymphedema uh, I've got nothing clever uh, I haven't got a solution um, uh, it is it is a problem um, all I can say is you know like in, re in reference to the previous question you you try to preserve the lymphatics where you can um, and if you can't and lymphedema does develop then you've You've got to deal with the lymphedema, but I don't have any wonderful sort of quick fix solutions, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. From the, uh, we now need to go on. So thank you, Ibi, for your lecture. And uh, it's uh, really an honor for me to introduce uh, Luke Teo, that it's uh, the president uh, of uh, the GSCAR group. What to say about uh, Luke, that uh, he is uh, the, a very known uh, researcher in uh, wound healing. Uh, he was the assistant professor of plastic surgery, head of the Department of Plastic Surgery, Barnes and Wound Healing at the Mopili University Hospital. He wrote um, more than seven books dedicated to these wound healing topics, uh, 16 chapters in books, uh, 153 lec uh, uh, papers, uh, even on Lancet, uh, diabetes, uh, and uh, high level of impact journal. He was the past president of the European Tissue Repair Society and of the World Union Society from 2004 and 2008. Now he is the president of uh, the French Society on Wound Healing and the, the Scar Club um, that uh, um, is uh, the organizer of uh, this wonderful uh, webinar. So the, before I uh, introduce the lecture, we have to thank uh, again Stryker that uh, was the sponsor of uh, uh, this webinar and the, like, the topic of uh, Luke Lecture will be non-invasive skin closure. Please, Luke. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Franco. It's a lot of uh, honor. Uh, I will just speak uh, today about uh, a, a very simple uh, uh, mechanical solution, which was devoted for pathological scarring, issuing for a uh, some years uh, from a, a U.S. company uh, with a very simple ideas and very simple material, but you will see that it uh, may have some uh, uh, possibilities in order to to maintain some uh, the edges of the of a suture uh, one to each other for a long period of time and changing the the, the face of the and the future of the scar. Uh, next, please. Uh, so uh, uh, Tom Musto, who was my, my mentor, used to say uh, theory drives practices. And you see uh, the end of the 19th century, this guy with uh, blood on uh, his hand, with a scalpel, is turning uh, his face to think about what he's doing. 
and certainly this is uh, uh, well uh, applicable to many situations in in, in surgery. Next, please. Uh, so Zip uh, was uh, got by the by Striker, and this is a chance for the product because uh, the previous company could could not go for further uh, uh, in order to uh, to to make uh, real uh, uh, clinical studies concerning this uh, this uh, product. So it, it can be defined as a rapid non-invasive skin closure modality, can be used uh, instead instead of suture, glue, staples, and tape strip for uh, skin closure with an adjustable tensioning mechanism. Adjustable tensioning mechanism. We'll come back on that. And you keep in place for two weeks or more, and you will see that you can keep it for two months uh, uh, in place. Next, please. Uh, so the 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 system is is um, a core of uh, of uh, a plastic uh, a band which is uh, going from uh, one side to each other, preventing the movement not only uh, transversally but also longitudinally. So you have a double action on uh, reducing the movements of your uh, the edges of your uh, suture. Next. Uh, so this is uh, the the product is non-invasive, of course. Uh, you will uh, peel and then place it on on the incision. You adapt, you 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 cut it at the adapted uh, the correct length, and then you, uh, which is the original thing, you can adjust uh, the closure tension. So you 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 just uh, exerting some 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 pressure. And uh, uh, it will adapt exactly, and the edges of the of the of the suture of the skin will come uh, uh, together, uh, and you you can maintain them at the right distance. The 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 the, the force, the main argument of this device is that uh, it uh, sticks very well. It's a, a mix of uh, carboxymethylcellulose and uh, and and a glue. And uh, uh, and this is really uh, uh, adherent and perfectly adherent for uh, uh, well weeks, I would say. Next, please. So my personal experience was uh, uh, I, I I tried to challenge a little bit the product. So after skin excision for tumors or for uh, 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 scar revision, uh, including uh, flap repositioning or scar over mobile areas like joints and I, you will see that uh, this is something that the orthopedic surgeons uh, used to do now or post birth scans and we had uh, uh, close to 50 cases that were uh, published next please next slide please yeah uh, so we have a bad a bad scar uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, in the first series uh, 21 patients and then in the second uh, 27. Uh, the age range was uh, 14 to, to 67. Uh, most uh, of the incision in, in the shoulder, back and chest and other locations. Other type of uh, many types of different uh, scarring, uh, hypertrophic scar, uh, caloids, and uh, uh, well, uh, we used uh, the the zip uh, in order to to maintain the the the, the, the skin incision after uh, resection. Uh, so you, in this very difficult uh, area, uh, we transform this bad scar into something which, uh, uh, well, is not a perfect scar, but uh, allows a much better uh, uh, result in terms of uh, cosmetic and in terms of uh, function. Next, please. Next, please. Next slide. See another case, which is uh, uh, which shows you uh, the the capacity of maintaining in difficult. This is an elbow. Uh, this is a scar uh, post burn, and we did uh, two uh, two uh, successive uh, uh, scar revision, uh, and we ended with the one uh, scar, which was uh, not so much enlarged and much better in term of. Uh, 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 in terms of cosmetics, uh, two years after serial uh, excisions. Next, please. Uh, challenging situations on the on the on the nose, uh, preventing to have a flap, and just uh, showing that uh, you can maintain for uh, 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 for some weeks, three four weeks, uh, the tension with a, a scar which is which is correct at six months. Next. Another case on the uh, on the check, which shows a, a scar which is not bad. Maybe it could have been better, but this lady was uh, over 65 
and uh, uh, at a, a casino, and uh, she didn't want something else. Next. Uh, Post-bariatric surgery, uh, you know, uh, these difficult cases where some, um, uh, sometimes you get an enlargement, a secondary enlargement of the scar. And here, for the, this is the aspect after two months of, uh, of, uh, of uh, zip. Uh, and uh, next, please. Uh, another uh, very uh, interesting issue is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the scars located over a joint, and uh, especially transversely, especially on the uh, elbow, the posterior aspect. And after hygroma resection, uh, you can start uh, moving uh, quite quickly because of the uh, uh, stabilization of your of your scar. Next, please. Uh, this case came a young lady who was um, uh, well uh, addicted uh, to drugs, uh, and uh, she left on uh, on the floor for two days in coma, and uh, she got of course uh, uh, several uh, pressure ulcers two uh, at the shoulder level, one at the sacrum. And uh, we, we, we decided to, uh, to challenge the, the, the zip uh, by uh, using uh, after uh, uh, resection of the, this uh, pressure ulcer bilateral on the shoulder. Uh, we had a, the, the zip uh, put uh, applied on, on, on the left side uh, and the uh, uh, standard suturing on, on the right side. Next. Uh, the the wound was next please yes uh, the wound was bigger on the left than on the on the right and after uh, uh, one week uh, four weeks sorry we we had a, a complete stabilization on the left and on the right we had some decent uh, next please uh, the zip can be adapted to uh, any age and uh, in children it's well tolerated also. So this is a, a, a case that was done after uh, uh, scar uh, revision, post-burn scar revision. Next. Keloids also. And, and here we, 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 we ask a, a question which is uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical uh, forces and keloids. This is a question we frequently ask with uh, Ray Ogawa, especially, but with other specialists, which is, uh, is there any... any, any uh, well, uh, uh, pathological factor uh, concerning mechanics in the recurrence of keloids. So here, we uh, after two months of zip, we 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 did not observe any uh, recurrence in the in the keloid, and it was maintained for one year after. Next, and this is uh, another keloid which is uh, on the thorax on the young lady, and this is uh, the post-op view. Uh, the zip was applied two months after this, uh, just uh, uh, lozenic uh, resection. And you see after two years that the uh, uh, situation is quite maintained, no more keloid. And uh, the, even if the scar is not perfect, it didn't uh, came back to any pathological situation. Next. So uh, in terms of results, uh, it's easy, it's fast to apply. The adhesive are uh, strong enough to stay for two to three weeks. Maybe you have to change them after three weeks. It's painless. It's quite comfortable. They accept it, even on the face. Uh, you have limited inflammatory and skin uh, uh, reactions, and uh, uh, you have multiple sizes available and multiple uh, options, I would say. Uh, next, please. Uh, in the literature, when you come to, uh, to look at what was published, uh, there is a, a paper from uh, uh, New York for Alberto Carli, who is an orthopedic surgeon. Next. And on the knees, uh, it's, uh, they use it to close the wound, uh, finish the epithelial uh, closure, uh, the skin closure, and maintain it for uh, uh, weeks. And uh, uh, the conclusion of this uh, colleague was the reducing wound complications, uh, no wound-related readmissions. So a kind of... Uh, well, the proposal which is uh, capable of uh, reducing the, the rate of, uh, of infection. Uh, next, please. Uh, second, uh, on the ankle joint, uh, another uh, orthopedic surgeon, uh, Mark Vaughn from uh, Florida. Next. Uh, he showed, uh, he, he, he analyzed in terms of uh, blood supply, uh, blood flow, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, could find that zip has a better perfusion and promotes uh, wound recovery uh, compared to uh, with, with staples. So certainly the orthopedic surgeons are 
quite fan of this uh, of this zip and using them uh, because of the capacity of uh, 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 re uh, author authorization of movements quite uh, quickly after after orthopedic surgery next please uh, so, in, in conclusion, I would say that uh, in terms of uh, take-home message, it can be used as a suturing method when limited force are exerted on the skin edges. Uh, this, I didn't do that uh, in my series. I closed and afterwards I used the zip just for uh, maintaining the edges, but it is uh, uh, intended to be used as a suturing method. Um, a faster speed of applying uh, compared to a suture and staples, it's much more easy. Uh, uh, because you can control the, the, the forces by your transversal uh, uh, um, uh, applicator, I would say. That, uh, there is an increased comfort for the patient compared to suture and staples because you don't remove it uh, with uh, uh, no, no pain. Just uh, as good uh, or better cosmetic results compared to suture and staples and works well with uh, skin tension when skin tension is high. Uh, should be uh, reinforced by uh, suturing material when needed, I would say. Uh, minimal complications, uh, maceration or slippery, um, and my uh, per personal experience in, in plastic surgery show uh, a potential for closing uh, standard and high tension in incisions um, in uh, orthopedic or spine surgery uh, and certainly other indications. Next, please. I think it's, it's uh, yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. Waiting for question on the chat from the audience. Uh, that is the first one from Katarina Rosica. Would you recommend zipline for C-section? Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, the most clever question because uh, <laughs> because it's a limit. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, when your incision is uh, a little bit um, uh, well uh, reapproximating edges of a scar, which is uh, well, uh, which is not flat, which can be a little bit uh, in a reverse situation. If you apply forces on the edges too much you will have a kind of invagination of, of your scar. So maybe C scars uh, uh, is, uh, is the limit, uh, or if you use uh, the, the zip, just use it with a very mild tension, just reapproximating, but no more. I have a, a question. After the first time I saw this uh, uh, device in Montpellier, I tried to begin our experience in Padova using them on brachioplasty. And at the beginning, we used them on both. Then we uh, tried to understand if the outcome was different using incisional negative pressure compared to Z-plasty. And only my first impression was that at six months, maybe the incisional negative pressure has a, a better evolution. But I think that we would uh, um, organize a study about uh, this uh, topic because uh, in this simple technology, there are a lot uh, of uh, concept of mechanobiology. So there is a lot of science behind it. So uh, I thank you for uh, continuing to promote this simple device, but I ask uh, to help uh, us uh, with the company, considering that now Striker is a very big and important company all over the world to develop uh, a common uh, protocol of study to understand better what is the really positioning of this, uh, of this uh, very simple and uh, very cheap uh, product. The question is, some of our patients uh, abandoned the, the uh, device after one week because of itching. Do you have any suggestion for uh, convince them to go on? Uh, no, I, I had not uh, this, uh, this, uh, this complication, but I understand it. Maybe it's some, uh, well, it could be a, a, a kind of allergy to the carboxymethyl cellulose or to the glue. Uh, but in my series, I didn't uh, uh, observe that. 
uh, I don't think they change the composition, the chemical compositions. Uh, but uh, well, this is uh, uh, if it is uh, documented, uh, this is a fact and uh, should be uh, should be discussed with uh, with uh, with Striker in terms of uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the company should provide something which is less allergic if you observe uh, uh, some uh, allergies uh, or uh, well, re itching reactions. So I think that maybe uh, we will need uh, a common protocol uh, like uh, sure. kind sure. of antiseptic to use and uh, uh, trying to have all the same protocol of uh, uh, using it. Another question is about the recommendation on uh, barn cases, uh, I think post-barn cases. What is your opinion, Luke? Uh, concerning uh, uh, burn cases, uh, uh, I, I guess the question concerns uh, scar revision. In scar revision, uh, uh, we didn't observe a recurrence of the hypertrophy and uh, as you know, the hypertrophy is, uh, is uh, linked to the forces, mechanical forces exerted on, on, on the scar. So this is a good, uh, and certainly in the series I published, uh, there is a chapter in the, in the book, uh, which, uh, on the textbook uh, concerning the zip. Uh, you will see that uh, this is uh, maybe the best indication. Scar revision and limit the tension and the re uh, tendency to re uh, uh, reopen, I would say, uh, uh, is uh, well uh, uh, well maintained, well contained by 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 this uh, uh, by this uh, method, by this system. So, thank you. The last question: uh, Is there any effective advantage in terms of cost effectiveness with this technique compared with more common system normally used? It's not very expensive. I, I, I cannot say anything about the price because this is a striker's uh, job, but uh, it's not very expensive. Of course, it uh, uh, has to be compared, especially when suturing uh, and preventing uh, some suture material to be used. Uh, a, a cost economy, uh, uh, a cost efficacy uh, uh, study uh, should be done in order to, to really precise this point. Yes. Okay, I think that uh, we have to thank uh, Professor Luc Theo for this uh, lecture and uh, I want to launch uh, an, uh, another question for the future of uh, people that want to use it. I think that it, it will be very important to understand how much you have to, uh, to um, to cut, to try out uh, the scar, and uh, with, which is really the power of this uh, technology, one centimeter, two centimeters, because I think that uh, we need some step very well fixed by uh, experts like you, or by, uh, and that we are trying to understand this in our experience. So thank you again, Luke. And now it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Bandele, that it's the uh, co-moderator of uh, our webinar. Please, uh, Ulrike, go on. Thank you, Professor Bassetto. Good day, my name is Ulrike van Dalen. I'm from Antwerp, Belgium, and I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker of today. It is Mr. Peter Moortgat. I know Peter very well. He has introduced me into SCAR research about 10 years ago, and I'm very thankful to him for that. And um, Peter works in OSCARE. OSCARE is a multidisciplinary research and treatment center for patients with SCARs here in Antwerp. And he works there as a research coordinator, but he also treats patients on a daily basis as a physical therapist. Um, he has a specific interest in physical scar management. And the past years, he really has been looking into the possibilities of scar needling. He's doing, he has been doing research about it and he has used it a lot in clinical practice. Peter, I'm looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ulrike. Let's share our screen. And in the meantime, I would like to remind everybody to ask your questions during the talk in the chat. And then at the end, Peter will have the time to answer your questions. 
Okay, everybody, is my screen visible? Yes, good. Um, hello world, I would say. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, depending on where in the world you will be following this webinar. Um, and uh, yes, I am pretty proud that uh, the GSCARS community gave me the opportunity this afternoon to introduce you into the wonderful world of SCAR needling. These are my disclosures. So let's introduce needling and let's see what needling is all about. Well, we can say needling is some sort of therapeutic regenerative skin treatment. Um, it's also referred to as percutaneous collagen induction, micro needling, medical needling, or dermal needling. Uh, and especially the first uh, term says what it is all about. It's about uh, induction of collagen and about regeneration uh, on a collagen level. What do we do with needling? We are pricking the skin multiple times uh, with a device. Uh, it can be a roller, it can be uh, a stamp, it can be a needling pen. And due to those uh, pinpricks, we reset or reboot cellular function and homeostasis. Um, the targets of needling on a dermal level are collagen, on the, epi and the epidermis, keratinocytes, and on the epidermal dermal junction, melanocytes. If we take a look into history, it all started in 1995 uh, with Orendreich uh, and his brother, where they started with a subcision or a sort of dermal needling for scars. Um, I will show you later on what this exactly is. Uh, and in 1997, a Canadian researcher, uh, Ms. Cameron, she did a, a study on what she thought first were the negative effects about tattooing our skin. And the good thing was she only discovered positive effects. So tattooing was indeed beneficial for the skin and also beneficial for the regeneration of the skin. Uh, in 2005, the South African plastic surgeon Desmond Fernandez introduced it as percutaneous collagen induction therapy, and that is the therapy as, as it is known today uh, for a while. So we can consider Desmond Fernandez as uh, the founder of this technology. And then in 2009, we had the first person who was specializing himself in needling on hypertrophic burn scars. So here the scar needling comes into place and that was my mentor Matthias Aust from Germany who started with this. We use frequent uh, multiple devices to, to perform the needling and one of these devices is the subcision needle where Brothers of Orentreich started with in 1995. So it's a beveled hypodermic needle uh, where you can undermine the scar width uh, adjacent to the skin sur surface. You have three different approaches here. Uh, the first of them is a linear inserting and withdrawing movement, which is comparable to what a tattoo gun can do. Uh, the second one is sweeping a horizontal movement, and that is quite interesting to loosen adherences under the skin. Uh, and when you combine that with a vertical lifting movement, that is indeed perfect uh, to try to remove those adherences. Then a tattoo gun is also quite practical to use. Um, you have needle configurations in the tattoo tips varying from 1 to 27 needles. But you insert those needles on high speed, which means that there is a risk for over-treating. Uh, so we always use a low number of needles when we treat scars with a tattoo gun. And that depends on the location where you work in the face. It will be needles from one to three needles in a configuration. And when you work on the trunk, you can go up to nine needles. A circular configuration of the needles is preferred since with a rectangular or a square configuration, uh, you will have more risk uh, to induce new wounds. Uh, this type of device, the tattoo gun, is very suitable for treating scars in what we call hard-to-reach areas. Let's say the nasolabial area, 
uh, on the face, close to the eyes, uh, between the fingers, etc. The rollers are maybe the most well-known devices in the needling uh, area. The rollers exist already since 2005. It's a drum-shaped roller, and it can with uh, an eight-row roller. It consists of 192 needles. That configuration of 192 is quite important since it defines the distance between the needles. And with that exact distance, there is no risk that the needle will tear the skin apart due to the fact that with uh, a longer distance between those needles, it is possible that the needle goes in the skin uh, in a two diagonal uh, angle and then it can tear the skin. While here, it's not possible. The needle length can vary between 0.2 and 3 millimeters. And if we are talking about scar needling, we always use needles of 2 millimeter length and more. Because if they are shorter, the needles we will not reach our target into the dermis. If you roll around 15 times over an area, you get 250 holes per square centimeter. You, so you prick a whole lot of holes in that skin. Um, the rollers, they consist of stainless steel or titanium. They're pre-sterilized and you have them in a four row, eight row or 16 row configuration. Then the electronic pens are now gaining more and more interest nowadays. Uh, they are powered stamping devices uh, on batteries on a, or on electrical power. They are also useful to treat smaller areas and the intensity is controlled by adjusting the needle speed. If you have higher speed, there is less discomfort. It feels less painful, but there is more risk for damage due to the fact that you can move the needles and on the higher speed, you can, yeah, you can make more damage there. With the lower speed, you have more pain, but you also have more control. So it's it's very important that you find the exact speed that you need for the treatment you want to give. Uh, one of the main advantages here is that you can treat multiple depth of injuries in one person. So if he has a scar where, which is thick, thicker on one um, side of the scar than on the other side, you can just adjust your uh, length of your needles to treat the thicker part. Then nowadays, and that's not existing too long, um, microneedling is also combined with radio frequency. So they use insulated needles which penetrate the skin and the needles release radio frequency currents and then they induce thermal zones like in laser therapy. Because these needles are insulated, the epidermis is protected from damage here. Why does dermal needling work? Well, it's all about a wound healing cascade. We know the risk for pathological star scarring starts from the moment on we have a wound healing cascade which is not normal. Or it takes too long to heal the wound or there is too much inflammation uh, which also induces more hypertrophy in the scars. So let's take a look at every stage of the wound healing cascade uh, when you apply a needling treatment. In the first phase, the, hemos the hemostasis and inflammation phase, the vasoconstriction occurs immediately after the needle prick. The platelets form a fibrin clot, neutrophils remove debris and kill bacteria, and the macrophages release growth factors like the platelet-derived growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, and the transforming growth factors alpha and beta. A wound can be closed within two to four hours after the treatment which is a big advantage since when a wound is closed that fast, we will not see pathological scarring afterwards. We will see that the collagen will be remodeled and you will have a, a better collagen structure afterwards. When we go into the proliferation phase, which starts three to five days after the needling and can last up to three weeks, then we will see uh, the following uh, things happen. First, the angiogenesis, then the collagen deposition, granulation tissue formation, epithelialization, and wound contraction. The keratinocytes, they proliferate three to five days after the needling, 
and the TGF beta attracts fibroblasts to the wound. And with that TGF beta, there is another story here than there is with normal wound healing cascades. And we will talk about that uh, in a few minutes. When we also see a formation of granulation tissue, fibroblasts that proliferate into the wound with the help of fibronectin, and then collagen type 3 becomes maximal after 5 to 10 days. Epithelial wounds, they are simply cleft, which means that myofibroblast contraction here is minimized. In the maturation and remodeling phase, we see that collagen type 3 is replaced by collagen type 1 over a year. Crosslinks are formed and they increase the tensile strength and the scar collagen can regain its tensile strength up to 80%. And collagenase breaks down the inappropriately oriented fibers of that collagen. In a study of ours et al, they also saw that the epidermal thickness increases after needling eight weeks post-op. This is quite interesting since there is a, a sort of skin barrier restoration after eight weeks, which makes that there is less chance for inflammation here, uh, less chance for dryness of the skin. And you can also use it here to treat uh, hard to heal wounds because the epidermis is thickened in this case. About the collagen 1 and 3 expression, uh, also discovered in a study of Matthias Aust, there was an increase in collagen 1 expression at all time points from 2 weeks up to 8 weeks. The increase in collagen 3 expression was significant after 4 weeks. And the collagen 1 tends to be more condensed just beneath the epidermis. And then about the TGF beta story. Here we see the needle go in, into the dermis. And what happens at the first time? The first two weeks, first we see the TGF beta 1 and TGF beta 2 come in action, which are the more pro-fibrotic TGF betas who we need for wound contraction. Um, the TGF beta 3, which is uh, the inhibitor of the former two, comes in place a little bit later and tries to control the action of the TGF beta 1 and 2. After four weeks, we see a decrease in TGF beta 1 and 2, while TGF beta 3 is still present in the same amount as after two weeks. And after eight weeks, all the TGF beta 1 and 2 growth factors have disappeared, while the TGF beta 3 growth factors are still in place to control the inflammation and to control wound contraction. Needling does not only have uh, an effect on the dermal level, on the collagen, but also has an effect on keratinocytes, which is quite important. Because, first of all, the explanation for the thickening of the epidermis lies in the fact that the keratinocytes can function optimally here. So that leads to skin barrier restoration. Keratinocytes, they release KDAF and KDCSF, and these growth factors, they regulate the degradation and synthesis of MMP1, collagen 1, and collagen 3. And all of this also suppresses these inflammatory processes. If we look at the melanocytes, they work in synergy with keratinocytes. We often see in scars, hypo or hyperpigmented scars after a while, which is, of course, due to uh, an unstable melanocyte uh, environment, let's say, and decreased keratinocyte function also leads to higher inflammation with pigmentation disorders as a result. The needling restores the keratinocyte function and also normalizes the crosstalk with melanocytes from keratinocytes with melanocytes. So, needling regulates MAPK activity, preventing overproduction of pigment. And uh, I know a colleague of mine, uh, Andy Williams in London, he often uses that, uh, the needling pens to try to treat hyperpigmented scars, and he has very fine results with this. Uh, a recent study from Schmidt uh, also indicated that which genes 
were upregulated or downregulated after microneedling. And maybe the names of the genes doesn't, don't say you that much, but if we take a look at the type of genes that are upregulated, we see that they are all involved in anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory processes. They are up genes that are upregulated are involved in tissue remodeling, wound healing, epithelial proliferation and differentiation, immune cell recruitment, epidermis development, and also the HR proteins, what we can see here. Down regulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, antimicrobial peptides, and cytokine uh, regulated signaling pathways. Well, these are the more pro-inflammatory uh, actions and they are down regulated. So now let's take uh, a small step into the clinical world and then uh, we go to a study that we performed in our center in Oscare. It was a pilot study on the effects of microneedling on dermal thickness and density of scars. So all patients were adult Caucasian patients with scars uh, already older than one year. Scars were located on arms, legs, or trunk, and we used uh, a derma roller, uh, 2.5 millimeter, um, and we applied two treatments with three months in between. So we did measurements at baseline before the first treatment, after three months just before the second treatment, and after six months, three months after the second treatment. For methods, we, for assessment, we used as subjective assessment the POSAS patient scale and observer scale, and as an objective measurement device to measure thickness and dermal density, we used a high-frequency ultrasound scan. So up to now, we have results of these two uh, needling sessions for 19 patients, of which 8 men and 11 women. Uh, the mid uh, yeah, let's say the mean scar age of these patients was 20 months, so definitely older than one year, and 10 were located on the arms, five on the legs, and four on the trunk. So here you see the results for the patient scale of the POSAS. The green line uh, says you what the patient thought about his scars before the treatment, and the blue line uh, represents the results of the patient scale after two treatments. And you see that the blue lines are completely inside the green line, which means that all results were, uh, the, were better afterwards. There was an improvement in thickness of 44%, also in stiffness, texture, and global opinion. If we take a look at the observer uh, results, we saw the same things happening here. Uh, although the results were less significant, um, when we have 40 to 50 percent in the patient scale, we saw 27 percent, 37, 19 percent uh, on the observer scale. Uh, as we know, clinicians are not always uh, so satisfied with the results. They are more, yeah, uh, reluctant to say that it has improved. And then, if we take a look at the objective measurements, we see quite good results. For thickness, there was an improvement from uh, mean 3.9 millimeters to 2.6 millimeters after six months. Uh, the effect size was 0.88, which means that it was a large effect. And if we take a look for dermal density, this means the number of pixels that you see, and the more pixels you see on a high frequency ultrasound, uh, the more loosely woven the collagen is in that dermal uh, content in the extracellular matrix. And you see almost double figures there for the dermal density with a very large effect size. Of course, these numbers can say you anything. The pictures say more than a thousand words. So on the left, I will always show you the pictures of the patients. And on the right, you will see the high frequency ultrasound results. So these were the pictures before. Then this was the picture after two treatments. And if we take a look at the ultrasound results, you will see a lot of more pixels, which means more loosely woven collagen here, and also a thinner uh, dermis. 
The second patient was a younger patient with a scar on the shoulder, a sort of soft uh, hypertrophic scar. The result was quite nice, especially for color and also for thickness, because you see, maybe the, the dermal density was not so spectacularly improved, but the thickness was uh, yeah, more than two millimeter thinner afterwards. And this was also one of the nice results from this patient. After two treatments, we saw this, and that was the result on the high frequency ultrasound. Here you see the more keloid like uh, hypertrophic scar. It's not definitely a keloid, but hypertrophic. That scar was also older than a year, but was persistent, uh, showed persistent redness and persistent inflammation. Uh, the pictures show you the results after one treatment, after three treatments, and in this case also after five treatments. Uh, here you see it on a, from a look from a profile angle where you see that the scar became much thinner. And now I will show you the ultrasounds. In the beginning, there was not a clear uh, uh, alignment of the dermis uh, to the epidermis junction. On the second ultrasound was after one treatment. We already saw this result. After two treatments, you see a significant decrease in thickness and a significant increase in density. And after three, five treatments, it looked uh, almost similar to normal skin and was a lot thinner. So, as a conclusion, microneedling takes care of repair of the epidermis and no ablation compared to fractional laser. It stimulates collagen synthesis without fibrosis. It stimulates scarless healing and it's also a stimulation of growth factors. So it's a very feasible therapy with uh, a very short aftercare. Uh, and yeah, for patients, this is very interesting because they can really show themselves outside again after two or three days. Uh, if you have a CO2 fractional laser therapy, it takes at least a week to two weeks before you can show yourself again. So I thank you and just to Conclude uh, an announcement of two conferences which take place in the first half of 2021. The first one is indeed uh, also the Yuma and G-SCARS and Journée Cicatrisation Collaboration, uh, which takes place in Paris from the 7th to the 9th of July. And the second one is the SCARS 2021 meeting in Berlin, which will be a virtual meeting. I can tell you that already. Um, and that will take place at the end of May. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for your talk. And we have already some questions in the chat. Uh, maybe I will start with um, combining uh, two questions from Esther Middelkoop. I think the, the main question is in uh, which time frame do you apply the treatments? Uh, she always also was wondering um, why you should why you would use this uh, scar kneading technique on uh, immature uh, scars. So maybe you can comment on that. Well, with pleasure, of course. Um, when we started the treatments ourselves, we also uh, thought that it would be mostly useful in older scars because uh, we didn't know exactly what, were hap what was happening inside and we were a bit reluctant to use it already on very young, immature scars, but since we know more and more, and since we know that it has its role in the remodeling, uh, and also already the, let's say, improves the wound healing cascade from the beginning, we are now using it more and more in immature scars. I even know that Matthias Haust already tried it on very young, fresh burn scars, meaning burn scars that are only three to four days old, uh, I haven't done that yet, but we also use it now on scars that are only three months, two or three months old, let's say. And due to the fact that it suppresses your inflammation uh, a lot, gives you the opportunity to use it in an earlier stage. And isn't there a reason why you choose to apply this on a specific young immature scar? 
because maybe the, the natural maturation could also have uh, a good results. Do you have certain reasons why then you apply this technique in a very young immature scar? Well, it's the same reason as why people also combine a pulse dye laser with uh, the other scar management techniques in the early phases. They, we want to try to control inflammation uh, in the beginning and also needling could add up to this to control and to modulate your inflammation, suppress it as much as possible, and therefore uh, you have an advantage over your natural maturation. Because you don't know in advance whether that, uh, whether that scar will develop uh, pathologically, and if you can control and modulate it from the beginning, then you are in control, let's say. Okay, another question from Nicolina. She uh, asked, is this therapy useful in patients with diabetes or maybe uh, should we take, um, be uh, careful with other kind of comorbidities? Well, diabetes is not a contraindication since the pinpricks uh, close very fast. Um, it's also not, uh, let's say that people with, who use blood thinners uh, are also not a contraindication. If they stop with the blood thinners two days before the treatment, uh, you don't have any risk afterwards because the wounds are closing very fast. So you could use it also in patients with diabetes, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have a question from Katarzyna and she asked whether you would apply this technique on uh, children. Is there a high risk of forming hypertrophic scars in this population? Well, we all know that indeed children have a risk of developing more hypertrophic scars, even keloids, uh, especially when they're at the age between 8 and 15 years old. Uh, we know that it's due to hormonal uh, reasons, uh, but it can also be due to genetic reasons. If you, um, we, I, I tried it on children and let's say, or it doesn't have any effect if the hormonal factor is included, then that means that you have to wait until the hormones uh, aren't there anymore. We see the same, by the way, with pregnant women, where the estrogen activity is also upregulated a lot. Um, and then the result of the needling will be less, there will be less results. Um, the same with genetic predisposition for keloids we don't see very good results there. It's not a contraindication. I would say the, the things that, uh, where I'm reluctant for to use it on children is because when they're too young, yeah, you have to do it on, under a sort of general anesthesia because if you do it with a local anesthesia for children, this is not very pleasant for them. And under general anesthesia, uh, if you have to do it, two or three or more times, then it's also not so good. So that's the only reason why I don't do it often, but it's not really a contraindication. Yeah, and that maybe brings us to a final question of Gillian, who asked uh, whether you use EMLA cream or another local anesthetic when you use this in clinical practice. Well, um, let's say if you use, when you use it in clinical practice and don't do it under general anesthesia, um, then a local anesthetic is the best thing to use when you use a roller. When you use a roller, you apply a, re a rather high force, and that's rather painful with two and a half or three millimeter needles, and patients, they can't uh, stand that. So you use a local anesthetic. Um, you have the advantage if you use a local anesthetic, you can already do a subcision with the needle of the that you use for the anesthetic. Um, of course, there is a fluid inside, but you, with the roller, then you spread the fluid immediately and your effect will still be deep enough. On the other hand, when you use a tattoo gun or uh, an electrical pen, then we only use cream. Why not the local anesthetic? Because the fluid there uh, is not been spread. If you use a, a tattoo gun, then the needles go in at a very high speed, but without any pressure. And then you are only yeah, needling uh, the anesthetic and you're not going into the dermis deep enough. So that's why we only use the MLAC cream uh, for 
electrical needling and tattoo guns. Okay, thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for your talk and for your giving us your insight on uh, this topic of scar needling. Um, and then I think we can go to uh, the final information for this session. Um, I would like to point out that G-SCARS, um, the group of G-SCARS has written a te textbook on SCAR management. You can have a free download by scanning this uh, code. So uh, it's a very interesting book. I have been looking into it. Um, please take the time to scan this. This was already uh, pointed out by Peter. There is an upcoming conference by the European Wound Management Association um, in Paris in um, 2021. So take a look to it, uh, to the program and how you can enroll for this conference. Um, then we have the upcoming event in Tokyo of uh, Global Scar Society in December of 2021. Um, it will be hosted by Professor Ray Ogawa, who gave the sessions, the last sessions um, of these webinars uh, in uh, January, I think. And then we have um, the next webinar of uh, like this one. The next one will be uh, the 19th of March at the same time. Professor um, Esther Middelkoop and Dr. Luctio will be talking about artificial dermis. Um, Esther Middelkoop will look to it from a fundamental point of view and uh, Dr. Luctio will look, it, look at, the, at it um, from a clinical uh, point of view. So already, you can already note it down in your agenda. Please uh, also subscribe to the YouTube channel and then you will uh, be informed about uh, the next event. With this, I also would like to thank all the speakers of today. I would also like to thank all the audience, everybody from every country, for also for being interactive um, in these strange times. It's uh, really, it gives us a good feeling to be connected with each other. And I hope to see you the next time. Thank you very much.